uh, I first of all want to thank Images and Sound for presenting this hour. Uh, we have an hour, I've been told, we can't go over the hour, and you've got two actors up here, so <clears throat> the potential for that is, is quite high. I understand some of you have got planes to catch, and apparently the Pullman is doing discounted drinks at 7 o'clock. So, yeah, that'll stop us going, yeah. going over the hour. Um, we decided, based on apparently an inspirational story that, that Wenham told me about Elvis Costello once in a session, um, had a spinning wheel with all his songs on it. Is that right? And, and, Correct. And it was, a, it, was a way, it was a way of, and people got to pick songs. It was, it was a way of kind of loosening up the session. So we thought, because this is the last session and you've spent a lot of time here over the weekend listening, that uh, we'd like you to... Um, if you haven't already, just write down any kind of random question that you'd like to ask David over the next hour that we can then use in the session. And I'll just pull them out of the box every now and then so we can kind of surprise you mm. with um, questions perhaps you've never been asked in your life before. That'd be good, yeah. yeah. Something to surprise me would be really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've seen so much in your life, haven't you? Uh, uh, yeah. Mm. Also, um, I tend to find with these sessions as well that, you know, we often have a Q&A at the end, which is fine, but also if we're talking about something particular and, and I'm not asking the right question or you feel there's something more that you'd like to know, stick your hand up at the time, because I, you know, this should be, I think, as interactive a conversation as possible. Um, I'm sure I, um, I don't need to introduce him, but I, oh fuck, that's my phone. <laughs> Sorry. Mm. That'll be my agent. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, you better take it. <laughs> See if there's a role in it for me. This is David Wenham, ladies and gentlemen. Um, one of Australia's most celebrated, credited, successful actors with over 30 feature films to his credit and dozens of awards, <laughs> I'm told. <laughs> Via the internet. <laughs> by, the, by the internet. He's worked with an enormous range of Australian directors and actors and international as well and was voted apparently uh, for Stop. one year more than voted Australia's sexiest man alive. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we'll start there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when was that? <laughs> It, it was actually, I think, probably about 20 years ago. It was exactly the same time. Um, that particular year, uh, a film that I did of a stage production, I, I did a play called The Boys back in Australia, more than, more than 25 years ago, actually, in a very little theatre in King's Cross. And it was a very successful play. And in this little theatre, we used to look out the um, dressing room at night, and there'd be a, a queue that would snake around the lane in King's Cross of people literally waiting for cancellation tickets for that play. Um, the production manager on, on that production was a guy called Robert Connolly, who then, you know, subsequently has become one of my best friends, went to film school and has become one of Australia's most successful directors and producers. When he went to film school, he said to me, do you think that play that we did would make um, a good film? And I said, no. Um, and it took about another 18 months before I thought, maybe it would make a good film. And to cut a very long story short there, we did make the film. This, the, the, the year that it was released, um, and it premiered in competition in Berlin, the same year that was released, I did a television sh series in Australia which became quite successful called Sea Change, and I played a character called Diver Dam, which sort of people quite had an affinity with. Um, he was quite sexy. Oh, there I you go. Remember. I, I yeah. came over here with Robert to do a publicity tour for the boys. And when, when Sea Change aired in Australia, I wasn't in Australia the whole period of time that television series aired. I was in Hawaii shooting a movie. So when I went to Australia, it was all news to me that suddenly I, I was well known and whatever. I came here 20 years ago to publicise the boys. And I can remember very, very clearly doing a, um, an interview on morning television here in Auckland with a man who took himself very, very seriously indeed. And that sort of amused me. But they wanted me to do, and I can remember this very clearly, they, this article had just come out in Who magazine, I think, voting me sexiest man in Australia or whatever. They wanted me to do this interview in a spa in my hotel. <laughs> Robert Connolly and I laughed for about half an hour before uh, we just said, no, that's not going to happen. But I can remember in the interview, this particularly, uh, particular man who was the host of the morning show at the time, with a very sort of pokered face, kept looking at me and after about 10 minutes of asking questions said, 
could you please tell me why you were voted sexiest man in Australia? <laughs> And I didn't have a, an answer for him, so yeah, maybe I, I, I'm on his side. Have, have, you, have, you, have you thought about that since? Could you tell us why? <laughs> no? you, you'd have to track down that journalist, but I think it's called publicity. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what it is. So, I don't think he can take those things seriously. Like, a, a, a couple of months ago, I was actually voted, well, God, you, you, of course you can tell from this, the, the best dressed man in Australia, but I was only best dressed man in Australia because the lovely... Uh, Pete, stylist on that particular shoot dressed me with the most magnificent um, clothes from stores that I've never been to in my life and therefore I was the most fashionable man in Australia. It's all about illusion. Absolutely. Smoke and mirrors. Let's, um, so the boys, actually I wanted to talk about that because so, the boys was quite a, an important moment for you, right? Because you trained at a drama school. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then how long after that did, the, did you make the boys... I, um, I did that little production of the, the play probably about two years after I graduated from drama school. And it was actually directed by a guy that I went to drama school with and trained as an actor. And in fact, that was the only production he ever directed. And it was one of the most successful productions in, a small production, but in, in Australian history, probably over the last 25 years. Um, so that play was about two years after I and graduated you, And your school. involvement in that was more than... Um, an actor, you know. You, the film? Yeah, the film, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I was invited by, it was produced by Robert Connolly and John Maynard, who many people here would know and spent many years over here in New Zealand. It was John Maynard, actually, who's got a great history of championing um, young people and really giving them a chance. It was actually John who asked me if I'd actually come on board as an associate producer, and he said, I think you could actually learn something here about the whole filmmaking process. And I've got to say, thanks to John Maynard, he actually gave me an insight into the industry that I never would have had otherwise. And I've just, a little while ago, I directed a, my, my first little film, and I had a little screening just for, uh, two people we brought in, myself and the editor, to have a look. And I actually brought John Maynard in um, to have a look at the film and uh, give me advice. So he's still in his later years acting as a bit of a mentor. What did you, can you remember what it was, like what the insight was, the experience of making the boys, what it was that you learned as an actor moving over into an associate producer role? Did it, did it kind of broaden your, your view of the industry? Did it change you as an actor? Um, I don't know if it, it certainly didn't, no, it didn't change me as an actor, but it gave me um, a knowledge base that's helped me over, over the last, you know, 20, nearly, nearly 30 years and has allowed me actually to generate my own work. And it's actually, that, that film was made for, I think, just under a million dollars in Australia. Um, it was very, very low budget. And my training, and I talked about it yesterday in, um, in the, the session that I had, my particular theatre training that I had really helped in terms of the producing capacity on that film. I trained at a place in Australia that doesn't exist anymore, and all we had was a tin shed for three years. We had nothing else, we had no facilities. So we had, we were, we, it was up to our imagination and we were forced to be very ingenious in terms of how we would solve problems. Um, so for three years we did that. When it come to producing, helping to produce um, the boys, that really came into, into play because we found, I found very left of field along with John and, and Maynard, uh, John and Rob, very left of field ways of solving problems that normally in you know films that have money you just throw money at it. Do you think it makes a better a, a better product? Product. A more, well, for that one, it a, for that one it actually worked because I think if that film was you know if we had ten million dollars it actually would have ruined the film. It actually gave a real it actually gave an edge to it a reality to it and it actually made the film real and raw. Um, yeah. and, and that appeals to me. Because you, you said to me, I'm just wondering, you said to me that you thought that good actors are, you know, insecure, creative, hungry people. And I wonder if you could translate that to the, the whole business of, of making something, of creating something, that if you're a bit insecure, you're a bit hungry, it kind of, an, it, it, it puts a tension around... I, th I, I think two different things, actually, yeah. I've got to say. I think I'd delineate between the two. I think... Uh, I, I do believe that the best actors are slightly insecure. I think uh, people who are... Uh, you have to be, especially actresses, actually, the best actresses I've worked with, I, I think, are slightly unhinged. And, and I think... <laughs> I, I think it's true. Uh, um, my, yeah, you don't, don't agree? Um, 
But it actually, no, strangely <laughs> enough, it gives you access to parts of your emotional makeup that that you're completely open, then you actually have mm. access to a wider variety of, uh, of range of emotions than if you're actually quite taut and compact and whatever. Um, the fear factor we, we spoke about briefly before as well, mm. I think it's a mixture of, you sort of have to be confident as an actor, and Guillermo um, mentioned it yesterday in the his abyss. session. Yeah, mm. you, you have to, make sure that the actor is confident in what they're doing. The minute that you take that away, they're not going to be able to perform to their ability. But an actor, a good actor, I think, just naturally comes with, um, with the, the sort of, uh, I don't know, it, yeah, standing on the abyss because you actually don't know what you're going to enter into. And I think that's... Is there a problem as you become more experienced and... Um, uh, you know, and, and older, I guess, that the fear starts to go? Like, do you naturally... I can tell you, well, uh, you mentioned as well, it doesn't. Strangely enough, um, as I've got older, the fear has actually increased. Um, even just talking in the, with this session now, before we began, I, I, I felt um, uh, very nervous. Public speaking is not something I, I do naturally. I like having a script. I like being in control of what I'm talking about. Um, so this is like, this is really standing on the edge of the, the cliff for me. Um, I find, I find it's easier. Actors, the best actors for me are children, um, and I, it never surprises me that children uh, um, ha have great performances. Like Top of the Lake here, that Philippa here, who produced the character of Tui, and that it was never any surprise that um, that that performance was amazing because children children can um, easily uh, dispel their belief system. They can easily access their imagination and they don't have as much um, baggage on their shoulders as we have as we get older. I believe it gets harder and harder to actually act as you get older. I think it's harder as, um, uh, as your reputation increases as well because um, there, is more, there is more focus on you, there's more expectation on you. It actually becomes harder, I believe. And I think if you look at, if you think of some of your, your favourite actors and even some of the great actors throughout history, I would contend that their best performances are probably in their 20s. If you think of, the, you know, I don't know off the top of my head, if you know, your De Niro's or whatever, I would say, and you think of their great films, they're actually earlier films. It's harder as you get older. But I think if you're aware of that as an actor, and I'm certainly aware, it actually makes me, strangely, work harder and challenge myself and really take on those how challenges you, and throw myself in. How do you work in. harder, though? You know, because it, it's so much of it is You about don't become complacent. Yeah. I think you, um, if you're involved in theatre, you keep yourself show fit. And I was talking to some actors yesterday about it. And I'm doing something when I get back to Sydney, having just done a production in Australia. I'm going to do, and I was inspired by that film, um, Vanya on 42nd Street, where a group of actors just got together and worked over a period of time with, with no um, desire to ever perform this, this thing or film it five years later. So with a group of actors back home, we're on a, loosely, on a casual basis, we're going to start getting together now and literally just reading and performing for ourselves so we actually just keep our, our skill bases up. And what are you... Um what do you, how, how do you surprise yourself now? I mean, you know, the, 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 whole, the whole thing about being a performer is that it is, and someone said yesterday in the, in the session yesterday that it's quite solitary in a way, is that you've just, you know, you, you've got all your internal workings to use with every character that you play. How do you pull the rug out from underneath yourself on a regular basis so that you can continue to surprise yourself in your work. Do you, do you view it in that way? Yeah, you... Sort of. That's something I spoke about yesterday as well. For me, um, surprise is one of the, the key elements to, to acting or, or any creative art, actually, to surprise yourself, but also surprise the audience and subvert their expectation. How do I surprise myself? By taking on, taking on um, characters that would challenge me in some particular way, but also once then I'm performing, um, not to have everything worked out um, before I'm actually going to either film or work on stage, but be open to be surprised by what's coming towards me <clears throat> and respond accordingly. Um, especially, you know, actors don't get an opportunity when they're, they're um, shooting a film. They don't often rehearse on set. 
So when you walk on set and you expose yourself to that environment for the very first time, there's stuff on there on that environment that actually might surprise you and to be actually open to that. Do you like rehearsals? Do you, do you, do you enjoy rehearsals? Do you, yeah, I do. do you find them useful? Uh, if they're, if they're utilised properly, I do. Yeah. I, if not, no. If, and it's interesting how, how different people, different actors, uh, utilise that, that time period and some people waste it. But it, it's a valuable time period, I think. Yeah, yeah, even if it, it, even if it doesn't seem valuable at the time, right? That you, it, it's, it's, it's almost the killing time with people that you're then going to go and... Pretty much, even yeah. if it eventually works out to be just a familiarity with the yeah. actor, whereby then you've built up a line, a, 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 a trust between two people that when, you're, when the cameras roll, and um, you feel as though you can possibly do anything with that particular person and you're in safe hands and you will go with them regard regardless of what they, they offer. What do you, how do you cope when you don't feel in safe hands? You know, you, you said earlier that you felt that the fear that actors experience is unlike any other fear. And ev everybody yep. in the business of making film and television has a healthy relationship with fear. We have to, mm. you know, whether you're producing or, or writing or directing or... Uh, but the actor fear is quite unique. And if you then are, are in an environment where either you're not feeling safe or connected to the other people that you're working with in front of the camera or yeah. with the director, do you have any, ex any examples or experiences of that? And how do you cope? It's an awful experience. Um, before yesterday's session, I, and I have, yeah, and a lot of times and I think anybody involved in acting here would have felt the same. The minute you don't feel as though you can trust the director or the trust is gone, it's really, really awful because uh, I'll relay a conversation. I spoke to my friend Robert Connolly before my session yesterday. I said, oh, any advice you could give, blah, 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 and he could tell me a couple of things. And then he passed on a little story that um, Mia Wasikowska, an Australian actress, is doing very well at the moment. She's also directed a little film in this compendium that I've also directed a film. And she said the interesting thing for her directing was the fact that coming from an acting perspective, it's very different from directors because directors have never had experience working with other directors by and large. But actors suddenly becoming a director have spent however many years working with different directors all the time. Mm. And so they actually have an overview of what works, what doesn't. And she actually brought up the situation of the worst thing for her as an actor is when that line of trust is broken and she doesn't actually trust the director. And from an actor's perspective then, she is forced to be outside herself and actually self-direct and try to alter her performance. Whereby if, if there is actually um, a cone of trust between the actor and director, the best acting can occur then because suddenly the actor doesn't have to worry about anything out there and everything disappears. The whole, the, the camera, the crew, the boom operator, everything then just comes between the two, the two or however many performers and the reality just exists in that particular world until the moment of cut comes and suddenly that per the actor is you know, jolted out of it and then they can speak to the director and then the line of communication um, occurs. Do you it's experience that you know, sort of nirvana-like mm -hmm. state for an actor regularly? Oh, it's a bit, um, is not, it? not regularly, but that's what you're always trying to uh, you know, attain as an actor, that, that moment of everything else just falls away and you, you exist entirely within that world and it's completely believable and it could go on unless cut happened. Um, you could just keep going on. You know mm. that character so well, you inhabit that character so well that you could just keep going on. Creating, for, for an environment to be created where work like that can happen, obviously can, it can be created in lots of different ways, right? You know, yeah. the, the different kinds of directors and different kinds of sets. Um, if we were to talk about your relationship, particularly as an actor with a director, what are the things that are important to you? You know, is, is there a particular way that you like being directed or is it, is it, is it something more subterranean? That, it sort of is, yeah. you know, different strokes for different folks. And obviously, you know, we're, we're all individuals, even as actors, we're all completely different. And directors mm. are all completely different just purely because of who, who they are. Um, as, an, as an actor, um, once you're actually on set, I like the line of communication, obviously, to be open. But, um, but I, I would like, 
if there's a shorthand developed so that the conversation actually doesn't go on for terribly long. So, um, because actors actually, and I'm one of them, get frustrated, these are for directors, if the conversation is too long. Once, once you actually get the idea, you've done a, a, a scene and we're about to go again, just a few key words as to why we're going on. Okay, yep, got it, okay. Pshh. Otherwise, if there's too much time, it frustrates me between takes if there's, energy is lost and dissipated if there's too much time between takes. Suddenly you have to rev yourself up again, put yourself in the mindset and go. But if, you, if a, a dialogue can be, you know, pshh, condensed to literally like a few words, or as I mentioned in my session yesterday, there's a television director in Australia who is regarded as one of the best, and he's also regarded as getting the best performances out of actors. Um, and I worked with him a couple of years ago, and his directing came down to, um, to literally just a form of semaphoric language. And it was really, really simple. It was like, if he liked, you'd look over and he'd had his things on his head and he'd just go, and you knew that that was fine and go, and go again and you could try something different. Or you'd look over and you'd just go, which meant all it meant, and it's, uh, and it's something I talked about as well, is literally pick up the pace, which is something that very, very few directors ever say, but I would contend that it's the most important piece of advice to change or alter any scene. Because most scenes that don't work or are like dead fish, literally uh, lumbering in a thing that the energy is gone. Literally pick up the pace, to speak faster, and suddenly there's an energy and it becomes alive. So he'd do that, or the other thing that he would do is literally you'd look across and he'd go, which meant just tone it down just slightly. It was so simple, but those three different things, and as I say, he is um, regarded as um, directing, uh, as get, eliciting the best performances in acting in television in Australia. You, and it comes down to three simple semaphoric gestures. That, that phrase that you used, you know, like getting a good performance out of an actor, eliciting mm. a great performance out of an actor, do you, you know, in the sort of the, the, the age of the, the auteur director, do you think that that is part of, you know, do you feel that that's part of the director's job is to get a good performance out of you? Well, or is that something, or to simply create an environment where you can get it out of, get both, it out of yourself? Both. Yeah. If, if I used, a, say, a, a, a sporting analogy, what would be frustrating is like, you know, getting a team of football players together, really talented football players, but never reaching their full potential. They're just talented football players and you expect them to, to, to perform properly. A as a director, 90% of your job is, is done if you cast really, really well. Um, but act you want to reach your potential as well. So if there's anything a director can do to actually make you even be better, and ev not just one person, but the whole thing be better to actually reach the highest possible level of potential, that's what you're attaining because there's so many productions that I've been involved in. It's like, yeah, fine, you know, the acting was all right and whatever, but I can see watching it that it was like the potential wasn't realised and that's frustrating. Yeah, yeah, and that's the outside eye. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. 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 Do you and it's, inter well, it's interesting because a lot of our, uh, directors, I think, don't know actually how to relate to actors and actually how to talk to an actor to actually change their performance and get a better performance out of them. And I also think that they settle for, for something that they consider to be all right, but don't realise that there's something even better with it within that particular well, person. What would you say to those directors? You know, like if you were going to be... Have a conversation with actors and actually really, really talk and try to understand and uh, try to understand an actor, I think. I'm going to, I'm going to, please, oh, yeah. here's, here's a first question out of the box. Please, can you tell us the name of the drama school you attended? Oh, okay. I went to a place that doesn't exist anymore, and, and now it's part of um, the University of Western Sydney. It was called Theatre Nepean at the stage, and it was the first degree course of performing arts in Australia, and I was in the very first year of that, that course, and it had literally no money at the time, and that's why they, you know, the government didn't see any use in putting money into uh, training um, performing artists. And so eventually they pulled the money from the course anyhow. But it was called Theatre Nepean at the stage. Why did you go there? How did you end up I was, I, at I, drama school? I, I, tried, I, I auditioned for NIDA, um, but I didn't get in. And, well, yeah, I'll say I didn't get in. <coughs> I went there. And so, for... but, but what, what I, I guess um, prior to that, what made you want to be an actor? Did you come from a creative background? Did you... Were you in love with film? Were you? No, no, no. I, I didn't actually. I'd never seen terribly many films as a 
Uh, as a kid, I grew up, uh, I was the last in a very working class family of seven kids. Um, didn't have very much money at all. I had really very little exposure to film at all. Um, but I was supposed I was the archetypal last kid in a family and always was, I was, the very, I was a very naughty boy at school and spent most of my time outside the, um, the, the, the classroom actually because no teacher would have me in the classroom because I'd forever be entertaining the kids. I had strangely this desire even as a young kid to entertain. I used to, you know, want, I wanted to make people laugh. I could, I had a great ear for mimicry back then. I could mimic any teacher within the school. I mimicked politicians. I would mimic people on television. And so I would entertain people. Um, and so I, there was a just, I suppose, a primal need to entertain. Um, and there was a, when is, I don't know how old I was, 12, I think, there was a parent-teacher night at school and my parents um, uh, went to this parent-teacher night. And I went to a Christian brother's school in Sydney and there was a brother that, that taught me who, who my parents thought I sent round the bend and I probably did. And on this particular night, I can remember before the parent-teacher night, I, I walked by him and I said, oh, are you looking forward to the parent-teacher night, brother? And he said, yes, I am. <laughs> and um, he, he spoke to my parents that night and he said, your, your son, he said, I have the class in the palm of my hands and then suddenly he takes them off in another area and I can't control the class. And it was this brother, he said, look, what I would suggest to you, he said, your son has a talent. He said, I would actually suggest sending your son to drama classes. The very next Saturday, my parent, my father actually, enrolled me in drama classes. And I went to <clears throat> young drama classes at what was the Ensemble Theatre in Sydney. And then from then on, it, it sort of, I, I found what I wanted to do. And even though my parents had no money whatsoever, they, they were quite extraordinary. My father used to go to the, the University of, of Sydney every two years for the book sale, and he'd go there on a bus and get um, cardboard boxes and get cardboard, oh God, it's sort of a pretty amazing thing about it now. He'd get cardboard boxes of books on theatre and acting and buy them for $2 and bring them home for me. It was pretty amazing. And it was your decision to, it, it, was, it was you going to drama classes yeah, that yeah, inspired yeah. And then he, him and to then go and My, buy my birthday and Christmas amazing. presents, they'd save up and I got subscription tickets to the theatre. So I went to the theatre from a very young age. Even though I didn't see film, they spent money for me to go to the theatre. And so the, what, what changed life for me was the, seeing from a very young age, probably about 14, the magic that could be, um, occur on a stage mm. by actors pretending to be other people. And I spoke about this, you, you ask actually, why do I do it? And I suppose yeah. it's the same thing. I just finished a production in Australia and there was an actress in it, amazing actress, she's turning 77, called Julia Blake. And we were just in the, um, outside the dressing room one day and she said, you know what, she said, I, it still mystifies me why we do this. She said, it's an amazing thing. She said, I think about it, and she said, we're, we're dressing up, we're putting on clothes, and we, people are paying a lot of money to sit in a darkened room and watch us pretending to be other people. She said, intellectually, I'm still trying to come to terms with that. <laughs> and, and for me, it's the same thing. There is obviously, you know, people have been doing it now for thousands of years without actually having thinking about it but it's actually a very important function in society that we're doing. And strangely enough, I think that, you know, I, we've both got within us this primal need to literally just tell stories because it is a really important function in society because not only does it entertain us, but it also um, documents our history, we learn from it, and we actually leave a mark on it for generations to come. And uh, then they know exactly what our lives were like. Do you think it changes things? Do you think storytelling changes can change the world? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I think absolutely it can. Because um, you've had yeah. quite an, uh, you know, like dotted right through all your work. You've been, uh, you've had a lot of involvement in, you know, in projects that have been the retelling of uh, a true story and often a political or social event that's been really important in Australia. Yeah. I mean, most recently, Oranges and Sunshine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do. We'll, we'll, we'll pick up on that. Yeah, I, I do. I do actually think, especially film, film does have the power to change, to, to change uh, people and to change people's lives. Um, I, there's, a, there's a television series that I did last year that's just aired in Australia called Better Man, and it's a dramatisation of the last, the last Australian who was um, 
a, a victim of capital punishment and he was hung um, not that very many years ago in Singapore. He was a really you know, stupid, ignorant kid. He'd never done anything wrong in his life, but he went on this mission to smuggle drugs to actually get his, his family out of debt. And he had no history. He'd stupid. He'd taped it to... Oh, he actually had stuff on his body and, and drugs in his bag that he put through an X-ray machine. Shows how, you know, what a great criminal he was. But yet, um, as much as the Australian government tried to get him off, the Singaporean government hung him. And I played the defence attorney that tried to, um, to get him off and act as a pro bono case. This guy who I played called Julian McMahon is now acting for, I don't know if you people here know, a, a group of people... Um, called the Bali Nine, who are, some of them are also on um, death row. Julian McMahon, who I met and who I played, considers, he said, there's a couple of countries now in the world that really are seriously considering changing their laws and getting rid of capital punishment. He actually believes that this, um, this piece that I was involved in could actually be the tipping point to turn those countries around, which is pretty amazing. Um, Oranges and Sunshine that you mentioned are a, a film that I did about the forgotten generation in Australia and New Zealand. Um, uh, I, I think it was within a couple of weeks of that film's release, all these people who had suffered the most horrendous abuse in their lives, all they were looking for throughout their lives was for, uh, for a po an apology. Within two weeks of that film's release, the government in the UK um, uh, officially apologised in Parliament and the very next week in Australia there was an official apology in Parliament to the Forgotten Generation. I, I, I could go, there's a number of uh, projects I've been involved in. The East Timor Project, Answered by Fire is another one. Um, uh, another and film that I did in, in, in Hawaii that um, opened people's eyes to people who suffer from leprosy or Hansen's disease. It does, film can change people's lives. It, it Answered by Fire, um, the experience of, of shooting that in East Timor, where a number of the actors were non-actors from East Timor who were playing, um, often playing characters that they opposed in their real lives. So you were working with people telling their story with them, weren't you? That, that was amazing. I've done it on a number of occasions, actually. Work with people who's work with people who have lived the situation and they're not actors but they are acting, um, they're acting their lives. In this particular case it was a dramatisation of the, um, the UN forces overseeing the, the vote for um, independence in East Timor and we actually didn't shoot it in East Timor because we couldn't at the time but we shot it in the Gold Coast of Australia and all the East Timorese cast who came over just went oh my god it's exactly the same as uh -huh. East Timor but from that that was amazing, actually, because these people, some of them, one particular actor had um, witnessed unbelievable atrocities and lost um, uh, many of his family members um, to, you know, the Indonesian army, and he was a rebel fighter. And here he was in this series actually playing an Indonesian um, um, militia man against the East Timorese. I've got to say, his performance is one of the most extraordinary performances <laughs> I, I, I've yeah. ever encountered. And it actually gives, in those situations, a reality um, and a depth that I think would be very difficult, actually, for some actors to actually ever understand. I suppose, in a way, there's a great privilege in being involved in something like that because, of course, you know, back in the day, um, you know, 600 years ago, stories were being told to a community while the story was happening. You know, that was the kind of one yeah. of the... One of the one of the functions of theatre yeah. and now you know we, we make films and then they go through the, the process and then they're presented to people in the cinema and there's a great detachment in a way so to be able to be in the real world telling the story with the real people is a rarity and does that mm. does that change your relationship with your work overall you know like do you uh, uh, do you do you search for those kinds of I stories I now, do. Right? well you know you know what it's like it's like as an actor <laughs> you're you unless you um generate your own work, and I try to a lot of the times, you're at the whim and mercy of a, of a phone call. You actually don't know what's ever going to come your way. Um, but I suppose in terms of how your career e ends up, it's basically, um, it's from my perspective, it's actually what I haven't done that actually has carved out what I have said yes to, and that's actually, you know... So it's the no. It's when you've said no that's Pretty much, yeah, determined. yeah. And look, there's some interesting ones that I've said no to. I was like, oh, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Gonna, I'm going to pull another one out of the hat. Um, uh, which of your characters are typical Australians? Is it? 
Which of my coaches are typical Australians? Is yeah. it hard to um, is it hard to play characters of other nationalities? Oh, that's interesting, actually. Um, it, 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 bizarrely and perversely, it's actually, it has become harder for me as, um, as time has gone on. As I mentioned, when I was younger, I, I had like nearly a perfect ear for mimicry. And somewhere on the, along the way, for a, gr for a chunk of years, up until a few years ago, my ear wasn't as good in terms of just um, doing accent work. And it's only after having read, I, I spent a year being obsessed with the brain and I read a lot of books about the brain. For, you know, I spent a year doing different things. And I read a book that I know, a lot of people here read, you can buy it in the airport, The Brain That Changes Itself and, um, and Changing Pathways. And it mentioned how one of the best things you can do for the brain is you know, teach yourself an, a musical instrument. And, and so I did. Oh. Did you? I, what yeah, did you I did. teach yourself? I, I went off, I started to um, teach myself piano by myself, and then I took myself off to piano lessons. And after about two months of learning the piano, by some strange osmotic process, if that's a word, um, all of a sudden my ear for, for dialects and, um, and accents suddenly started to come back mm. and it was really strange and it was probably just changing pathways within my brain. And because the, the, there's always that problem, isn't there, when, you, when, you, when you're speaking in another accent that you end up just playing the accent. Yeah, you, you, have, to own it, you know, have to own it first and then, yeah, then once you own that accent and feel as though you're, you're within it, um, you're fine, but otherwise yeah, it just feels as though you're, you're impersonating someone, which is not, not a, a good way to act. Um, I would like to talk about the film Getting Square, you know, talking of typical yes. Australians. And also I get a sense early on, you know, you were, you know w when, when you were a kid and, and the, you know, the, the, the brother at the school suggested that you do acting classes, that it was kind of comedy that allowed you to, sort of an anarchic comedy that allowed you to attract attention in the, and pull it away from, yes. you know, the teacher in the classroom. And, yeah. and this is a, and could we, could we play this? Can, can yeah. I just say, some people may have seen this clip yesterday, it's only because Robin saw the film yesterday and said, oh, we've got to play that, uh, yeah, yeah. You, if you've seen it again. Um, and you'll see, as you can see here, it's bleedingly obvious why I was voted uh, sexiest man in Australia. <laughs> it's a beautiful performance, wouldn't you agree? And what I, what I love about that is, is how, is the power shift, you know? I mean, he runs rings around that courtroom. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that was... He gets the money out of them. That, he, it was written by um, a guy who is a, a lawyer and attorney in Australia who, all the characters in that film, he, he contends, are actually based on, on people that he knew and he actually saw a similar situation occur in court and to this day he still doesn't know whether the guy that Johnny Spateri is based on whether he did manipulate the situation, whether he was aware or whether he wasn't, which is a sort of interesting thing. Uh, the, the other thing that's ob very obvious, of course, is how brilliant that script is. And, you know, and I'm not taking away anything from your performance. Yes, you are, I am, I am. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, yeah. Not, you're nothing without those yeah, lines. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's but true. seriously, yeah, it's do, true. You, do you feel that if the script hadn't... Do you know what I mean? Oh, it's without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can't work unless it's there on the paper. The other thing that um, you know, I, I was fortunate with, but the, the, the film as well, is all the other performers with in that scene, um, especially Jonathan, who works opposite me, without, yeah. it, really generous performances. It was, everybody was really, really open and, um, and supportive of, of each other. It wouldn't have worked otherwise. His performance is really, really great, I reckon, Jonathan, oh, yeah. because it's very generous. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the other thing that I love about it is, is that it, it, your performance is, it's, it's a big comic, comic performance, isn't yeah. it? I mean, were you, it, I remember um, Frank Whitten, be, before he, you know, before he died, said once that working with Neil Armfield at Belvoir Street, that Neil said to him, uh, I, I only ever really hire clowns. Like, I want to find the clown inside each actor because usually if you can find the clown, you'll also find the great right, dramatic yeah. performance. Well, Frank was a great clown, yeah. Yeah, he's a great clown. And, and I wondered what you thought about that because yeah. there's a clown working. Without a doubt. I live, yeah. I live um, only about 200 metres down the road from, from King's Cross in Sydney. Like, the epicentre of... I, I based my character on people that I had known and observed over a dozen years of living in that area. 
when this film was released in Australia, there was a guy, a character not dissimilar to Johnny, who, who, um, who accosted me on Darlinghurst Road and just grabbed me and he said, you, and he accused me of stealing his identity, which I <laughs> thought was, was really fantastic. Um, that, that poor guy, I'm also at, in King's Cross, I'm a, um, an ambassador for a place there called Wayside Chapel, which actually, people like Johnny actually visit and, you know, Wayside helps out. And um, that poor guy has actually passed away since, but he um, was very well known in the area. But it, it was based, that performance was based pretty much entirely on people that I knew in and around King's Cross. Do and you... they were, some of the things I see in King's Cross are so big and so yeah. unbelievable that I could never, I, I'd never be able to put them on screen because you would not believe them. Do you believe that you, you would, uh, what's the, do you believe that you should be allowed to? Do you know what I mean? As often, sort of, but it's, it, a, it's literally just the fact of how far can you go before people would just go, that actually d it doesn't really represent reality. With, you know, the old thing about truth is stranger than fiction. It actually do it, it is. I, I see it because I live in so close to such a really heightened, fantastical world. I see the most extraordinary things on nearly a weekly basis when I'm home. So, uh, th therefore, how would you define your role as an actor? Because obviously, if you take that, th then it's not to necessarily represent reality, right? Well, it sort of is to an you know, Like you said, that that's a big performance, and it, and it sort of is. And I've taken a sort of great image. When, it, when I was shooting this up on, on the Gold Coast, I, I met this, this character, and I was dressed like that, and I'd walk down the streets and whatever, and I, I met a guy who was obviously um, o o on, the, on the juice himself, and he had a pet teaspoon and he used to take his pet teaspoon for a walk. It was the most, am I, I just remember now, it was the most amazing thing. I thought, God, I wish I thought of that. It was a taking, a, <laughs> taking a teaspoon for a walk. But if you, if you offered that up, you know. It didn't a, sort of fit there, but no. I took what I needed for that particular character and no more, because I'm also about as an actor, nothing extraneous. I, I, don't, I don't want gimmicks, I don't want stuff to distract from the, the essential reality of that particular character and that particular story. If it isn't actually useful or, or functional or really necessary to tell, get rid of it. Do you ever feel in any performance that you've gone too far? Do you, uh, you know? Do you think you've Not gone too far, but there's performances that uh, uh, probably I think well, maybe I, I, I missed. Yeah, yeah. Do you Without believe a as a uh, do you believe as an actor that you can play anything? You know, there's that. No. There's that. Uh, you know, when no, when one leaves drama school, you kind of think, oh no, I could. No, there, there, yeah. there, there's there's scripts that have come my way or, or things that I've read, and I, I know I can't do it. It's like no, I, I know that there's scripts that I read, and I think no, there's actually uh, other people could do that better. Do you feel me? That and, I, and what's great is actually mm. seeing films and whatever and you think. Fuck, that's great. And so I would have loved to have done that, but that actor does, I couldn't do it better. Do you feel that you've, those sort of powers of discernment have got better as you've got older and more experienced in the... Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you think you've changed yes. as an actor? Do you yeah, think yeah, definitely. Has your view of your job as an actor changed? Yeah, from when I you left drama school? Yeah, I, I think over the years, I've, I've, you know, you, you grow as a person and you become wiser. And yeah, I've become, I've become smarter. And also even in terms of my acting, I hopefully, well, I'm trying to become a, a better actor and trying to, that, that whole thing about, you know, seeking the kernel of truth and having nothing extraneous in performances. So you do, as an audience, they can just zone in and just see what is necessary for that character and that story. Hopefully I'm getting better at that. All I'm trying to anyway. And that, that's, um, th that's when you really rely on your director, right? Uh, your, your instinct and your director. You, yeah, if you can have that great trust with the director, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I'm going to pick another one out of here. Mm. Oh, this is a lot. Your, your Russian fans. Oh God. Are afraid? Right. Are afraid that you'll be so keen on directing that you'll forget about acting? Do they have cause to be afraid? Oh, interesting. Not completely, but yeah, I do have. Um, yeah, there's. I, I have a. I have a Russian fan club, um, and, and I just did a production in Australia, and um, and people flew um, 30 hours from Russia to see this production, which was quite. And people flew from Germany as well. People flew from Germany. It blew my mind, I got to say. Um, but, yeah, look. I, Are you going to direct more? Yes, I am. I've, I've yeah. directed one thing, and I'm hopefully directing something um, um, next year that I've written. And I've got to say, I love it. And I, I, I suppose it's just a reflection of where I am as a person now, as a storyteller. I want to, 
as that storyteller, I want to have control uh, over the story that I want to tell. Because as an actor, as we know, you're relatively, you know, a disempowered person because you give your performance, but then that can per performance can be, you know, chopped and changed and altered according to the director's vision. And rightly so, it is the director's vision. So I want to be in a position now where I have a story I want to tell and I want it to be that story, but I also want to empower everybody I work with, the actors, the, the, the DOP, um, the costume people, I want to empower all those people to be able to realise their potential and come on a journey with me that is completely collaborative. Do you feel that, because actors have to be so kind of pathologically subjective to be able to do the job, you know, you've, there's that sort of... Sort of, although I, I would, as I get older, I would argue that they shouldn't. Do, really? Why? Yeah, I would argue that um, uh, it would be better for an actor not to be so obsessed with themselves and their own performance. Do it for... A, a, a fair degree yeah. of it, but actually open up and be aware of where that character, where your character actually really does sit within the scene and within the, within the, 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 the whole picture. Because if you are completely subjective, you're so engrossed in your own character that sometimes you can do, with your character, you can do a disservice to the film. You might be doing um, stuff that is not necessary in the story. You might be doing stuff that is completely pulling focus and not actually serving the story. Yeah. yeah. I actually would contend, think, think bigger than yourself. It's like the actor who's cast as the, you know, the, the, the postman who just oh, arrives with the yeah. letter and has built a whole backstory, oh, exactly. but actually the, 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 the story just requires the postman yeah, to Yeah, delivering the, the letters, letter. yeah. yeah. I spoke about it that yesterday, I call it acting in isolation. It's like, mm. you know, that person's bit, yeah, exactly, done exactly that, but it's not actually really serving the purpose. They might be having a wonderful time and thinking they're really good and they're great, but um, in isolation they are, but together with a group of actors, they're not actually really um, representing reality where we talk, listen, think, respond and create a real situation. Yeah, perhaps, it, I mean, that's where kids can be, because so, they'll just deliver they believe. the letter, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. They, yeah. they really will be completely open and they'll do, you know, they will respond in a real way and they'll really believe what they're doing. Much, it, much easier for You kids. made me think before, you know, when you were answering that question, the, you know, the, the sort of the self-obsessive nature sometimes of, of performers, and I notice a lot, that uh, uh, particularly in film and, and Hollywood films a lot, that actors seem to have a more intimate relationship with camera than they do with the other performer oh, that's or with the boom. I mean, do you, do you notice that in, in your work that, 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 that sometimes it's the, the, the draw of the great shot or the. Yeah, you know, well, that, how that, that's when it becomes problematic, I think. I think mm. where, when actors become too camera aware. Where, when, I, when I was. Are you camera I mean, I, I'm very camera aware now because I, I know so much about that, what that machine does, and I, I know exactly what, you know, the size of the lens, what, I, I know, pre, I'm pretty much on top of most aspects of all of it. But what I want to do now is act, as an actor is get back to how I was when I acted um, for the boys, when I was completely ignorant of, of, of the camera, <clears throat> and so therefore I didn't have to worry about it, and I could just completely immerse myself in the, in the situation and trust that the director and the DOP and whatever would, on their own, <laughs> capture exactly what they needed. Um, for a few years, I've got to say, I, I, I'm guilty of it. I think I was too camera aware, mm. and I was actually trying to help out the director in a way by altering performance or, or leaning on talking, because I could, was always conscious of what the camera was doing. I, I'm trying you now- You don't do that now? I'm trying now to forget everything, when I'm an actor, to forget everything mm. I know technically. I'm going, to, I'm going to pick one more question and then, oh, then we've got to go to the pub. Oh. <laughs> oh, this is a great question to end on. How do you maintain your good looks? <laughs> <laughs> what creams do you use? Daddy, you've got to be Have kidding. you had work? Did you, you've just made that up. No, I wouldn't like make that up. Like, seriously. Like, yeah. Robert, Robin and Robin and Robin and I went out on the source last night with a couple of other people with we'd in the audience, and I tell you what, good looks. You've got to be kidding. It's like we had a nice night on the source last night, but um, good looks, really? How do you? I do nothing. I do absolutely nothing. Do, um, do you work out? Do you, are you one of those sorts I, of actors? Um, um, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, but I try. I try to keep. I actually try to keep <laughs> myself um, relatively fit because. 
I, I actually do think, you know, health, you know, the old healthy, healthy body, healthy mind. Do, do, do working in this business, geez, man, the, the hours that we work and the concentration that you have to have over a period of time, it really does pay to, to be fit. Um, you know, a few years ago I did an hilarious film, a great historical drama called 300. Um, <laughs> were, that, were they your real abs? And there you go, I thought that question was going to come out, yeah. whether uh, my real abs. Where I was forced to get fit and we were trained in a ridiculous um, way for five months and I was extremely, extremely fit back then and I loved it and I've, and I've taken, so I'm not like that anymore, but I've, I've taken some of the things that I've learned from, from that training, and I, and I do do them, even if I, I don't have it. I don't need a gym, all I need is a hotel room, and I know just a few different things that'll actually keep me in shape over a very small period of time. Were they, were they my, my abs? Yes, but they weren't. Um, people say, God, all of that must have been digitally affected afterwards. The film was made for six, 60, 55 or $60 million. It would have cost $100 million, I think, to digitally alter every frame of that film to make all our abs. I tell you what, what they did do though, however, we did get enhancement with a little bit of... Um, oh, makeup. A little bit of makeup, yeah, a little bit. But yeah. um, all the abs were, were there. The guy who trained us, Mark Twight, has a philosophy. It was not about building up or becoming bigger. It was actually about finding, cutting... Your abs are actually within, so it's not bidding them bigger. So it was actually cutting in and defining. They're I don't amazing. Have, they're amazing, yeah. yeah. I've got yeah, quite soft got the, abs. Yeah. They're, they're quite no, moulded. No, they're lovely. They're moulded, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I've, six pack I've gone to the slab. Now. I think we'll leave it with this quote, David, when am I don't need a gym, just a hotel room? <laughs>